Well, we are uh, going to continue on where we've been working in the book of John. If you've got a Bible, there's some in the chairs if you'd like to pull them out. Otherwise, Welcome Center has Bibles or iPad, iPhone, whatever you got. Uh, Android can look it up on version. We're going to be in John chapter 6 and the first 21 verses of John chapter 6. Uh, we're going to dig in there today. And we're going to see that it's actually a, a, a really complex chapter. And, and the first part of this chapter has... This sign, and, and a sign is just another word for miracles. Um, we've been using the word sign because that's what it's listed as in the Bible. And so there's a sign, this miracle, that if you have a, a background in the church, you'll know right away, getting out of the gate here, what that sign is. When we get to it, it'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I've heard that story before, of course. And, and then following that sign is kind of this ongoing segment uh, where we're, we're going to see Jesus doing some talking. Um, and, and it's going to tie in with what the last couple of weeks we've been talking about, which is the authority of Jesus. And we're going to see that authority kind of slamming into our human autonomy. And, and then men and women having to decide whether or not they're going to submit to the authority of Jesus. And, and what I find fascinating about John 6, 1 through 21 is to watch how Jesus uses his power and authority. And, and this is one of the very few passages here, one of the, one of the rarities um, where this miracle that we're going to be looking at first, this passage, is one that you actually find in all four Gospels. Um, all four have kind of a, a little bit of a different vantage point on it, but all four recount this particular thing. So with that, let's look at John 6, starting in verse 1. And you can see it on the screen probably here as well. And it says, After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, spoiler alert here. This is the key passage right there. This is the key part of the entire segment we're going to be talking about today. This little passage. Um, not the sign, but what the sign is pointing to. And if you're one who writes in your Bible, I would highlight that, that, that last portion of it, that little verse where it says, now the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was at hand. Because that's, that's the key to all of what's going on here. So if you underline or highlight or circle or star or whatever you do, that's one I would, I would personally write down for because we're going to be looking and digging into that a little bit. Uh, well, then it continues on in that passage, and it says, Lifting his eyes up, um, Jesus then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to even get a little. Now you need to know, 200 denarii is like a wealthy person's annual salary. So we're talking a significant chunk of change. And so, so Jesus says, Philip, you're kind of from around this area. How are we going to feed all these people, Right? Can we run down to McDonald's and grab some Happy Meals or something, right? And Philip's like, man, if, if a wealthy man were to give all of his annual salary, not even everyone would get a single bite of those Happy Meals, right? And that, that tells you something here about the immensity of the crowd that shows up on this day. But then look at this in verse 8. This is probably one of my favorite parts of the story. And it says, one of his disciples... Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Jesus, there, there's this boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Now, I love what just happened here. And it, it's not the, the, the key point in this text. Um, it's, it's not the main point of emphasis. But it's here, and, and I want to draw your attention to it, because I, I think it's pretty amazing. If you didn't notice here, Andrew loses faith right in the middle of a sentence where he starts off with this little smidge of faith, right? I mean, like, like, like how minuscule does the faith need to be for the power of Christ to flow from it? I mean, here, here's Andrew. He, he, he couldn't even get the sentence out of his mouth before he begins to doubt it, right? He's basically saying, you know, look, I found some food. Look, I, I, this boy's got like a, this kid's got a box lunch, right? He, he's got this box lunch. And then he grabs it and then he's like, oh, but 
what good is this going to do? Right? I mean, he had faith for a second, but it was gone by the end of that sentence. He has that at the beginning. He believed enough to bring the food to the attention of Jesus, right? But just then, his faith evaporates in a moment. And for just, just a nanosecond, he believed, and then it was gone. Has anybody else ever been there before? Uh, notice here, though, that, that Jesus doesn't rebuke Andrew. He, he moves in power through this tiny, tiny bit of faith that Andrew expresses. I mean, this, this little bit of faith that uh, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even survive the sentence, right? And if you've ever had faith for a moment and then lost it, be easy on yourself. You're in good company. Because that's exactly what just happened right here. And the passage continues on and it says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, Here, there's this boy with five barleys and barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? And then Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. He also took the fish and gave them as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the prophet who is to come into this world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. And it says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got in a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. Now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea coming near the boat. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now there's, there's a lot of phenomenal stuff going on in this text. And what I want to do is, is draw you into this main point of the sign. What the sign and what the miracle is pointing to. So that when we look at the bread of life in next week's sermon, you'll have context for what's actually happening happening in this text. Because if you didn't catch it, this boxed lunch that this kid has, five loaves, a couple fish, is going to feed something like 12,000 people. And that sounds impressive, but that's the smallest thing that's actually happening in this passage. And the first thing that I want to highlight, and look there in verse 2, it says, and a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. If you counted everyone who was there, you've got a massive, massive group of people. It says there was 5,000 men. So, so most people then estimate in commentaries and things like that, people who are in the know, that there's probably about 12,000 people there that day when you add in all the women and children who would have come along as well. 12,000 people sitting on the hillside, sitting in the grass, waiting to hear a word from Jesus. And most of them, we see in this passage, are likely not there because they have any intention of following Jesus and submitting to his authority. But rather, they're there because of his power, it says, over the sick. And he's been doing all kinds of signs and wonders. And they're intrigued. There, there's something there, right? They're seeing something. But they're not quite sure what it is. So, so they're out there trying to figure out what it is that, that's going on with this Jesus guy. And, and this is kind of that, that modern day equivalent. Uh, if you would use the analogy here and go with me, that if you would think of Jesus as something kind of like golf. Okay? Let me explain that. He's something you do just on the weekends, Right? Once we, once we get away from here on Sunday, there's then no Bible in their lives, there's no spirit in their lives, there's no surrender in their lives, there's no obedience in their lives. But then when the weekend comes and it's time to tee off, you're all in, it's time to go, right? And, and, and he's, 
he's talking to these people who are kind of this outer ring. They're, they're, they're t- touching with their toes, testing the water, looking at Jesus, but they're not committed to Jesus. They've seen him do some things, but they're not quite ready to jump all in. The text is clear. They are not there because Jesus is Lord. They are there because he can heal the sick and do miracles. That's why they're there. Now the Bible doesn't rebuke that. And Jesus isn't going to rebuke that. But his authority will confront it. And we'll see that again when I said next week when we get into this bread of life sermon. And you'll see what happens in that moment that that some believe and, and, and some begin to bail off the Jesus train. And, and the thing that I, I think here is astonishing, uh, it's, it's crazy to see this, is that, that Jesus cares for these people, right? These aren't people who are committed to him. They're in the outer circle, so to speak. These people are on the, the fringe, just, just, just trying to kind of figure things out on their own a little bit. Not quite sure what to make of this guy. Just trying to make sense of, of who Jesus is and what Jesus is about. And he cares for them. Maybe, maybe that's been your faith walk, right? Maybe your whole life you've kind of just been sitting in church your whole life and you can watch other people and you, they seem to love Jesus at a level that you haven't gotten to, right? You know, you're like, I don't know if I've got that gear. I've not gotten there yet, right? And you see other people that seem to really love Him and seem to really surrender to Jesus, but you just you don't quite understand what that is or, or maybe even how to get into that game, right? How many of you remember... I don't think I don't know if they do this anymore, but you remember jumping rope as a kid, right? Now, of course, we had we had, we, had, we had these things when I was a kid called rope skip rope climb, where we would practice jumping, and and they we had like school records on the wall of how many doubles you could do, and then rope climb, of course, was that thing where you'd climb to the ceiling, pray you didn't fall to the floor. Um, I don't know if they do that anymore or not. <laughs> But uh, we did that, and, and we did that before school. It was extracurricular. It was fun, um, competitive. But I'm talking more like the recess jumping rope, right? Where, where, where you had that, 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 that like 20-foot-long, that, that big one. And, and ooh, you ever, you ever seen those ones with the plastic little pieces? Like, if that thing hit you, it left a welt, right? But it, but it made a cool <laughs> every time it went around, right? So, so, so maybe your faith experience has kind of been like that. You, you, you watch those, usually it was the girls, doing that. And you're like, I, I want to get in, right? But, but when, when do I go, right? And, and I was always a tall kid. I wasn't necessarily, I was a coordinated kid. And I was never a good jump roping kid, right? I, I didn't have that, that timing to get in there. And, and, and then, double dutch. It's like jumping into a blender. No thank you, right? Anybody ever been there? Well, some people's faith is kind of like that. You, 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 you see them with that, 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 that jump rope going around, right? But you're like, I don't know if I'm ready. I don't know if I... I how do I get into that? And, and, and there are people, probably even here today, who that's how you've kind of viewed Christianity. And those are the people in this text right here, right? They see something. They're not sure what it is. And so they're kind of on the fringe with Jesus. But they're certainly not following him yet. So, so he does this sign. And, and here's, here's the thing about the miraculous signs of Jesus. When he performs them, they're always pointing to something. The miracles themselves don't terminate on themselves. This sign is pointing to something. And I think the most astonishing thing in this whole passage is that he, he takes this, this box lunch, effectively, five loaves, two fish, and he feeds 12,000 people. And, and even greater than that, though, what's amazing in this is the thing that he's actually pointing to. And as I mentioned earlier, now I think this is the, the key to this text. And the key to this text is not the bread and the fish. 
And it's not the, the, the fringe people versus his inner circle, because he's got his disciples there with him too, right? The key to this passage is actually the Passover. Now, now for you and for me, uh, Passover doesn't really mean a lot, right? But for first century Palestinian Jews, Passover was what it was all about. It was where they found their identity. It's where they find their nationalism. It's how they understood who they were as the Jewish people. Passover was everything. And what Jesus is doing is reminding them that He is the fulfillment of the promises of the Passover. A first century Jewish man or woman would not understand their identity outside of what Moses did in being used by God to to pull his people out of slavery, to pull his people out of oppression in Egypt. And Jesus is saying, I'm the fulfillment of that. That's what he's saying in this passage. The Jews found identity within the Passover. We are the chosen people of God, delivered by God, right? Made a people by God, provided for by God. I mean, God fed us with manna and quail, right? Manna from heaven, bread every day, falling down from heaven. God has given us a a, a promised land. God has protected us. And so if you were a a Jew back then, the Passover was a big, big deal. And every single year they would get together to remember it, to celebrate it. This is who we are. And that's exactly what is going on when Jesus takes this kid's boxed lunch and he feeds them all. The point isn't the bread, because he's about to preach a sermon where he says, I am the bread of life, right? And and this is one of three different Passovers we see. The first Passover was spent when Jesus was, was teaching I am the temple, and, and this temple is going to be torn down. And when it's torn down and destroyed, it's going to rise again through the Spirit of God in three days. And the Spirit of God is the same Spirit that dwells within you. And what he was making a point there was that not that we had to go to a specific place to worship, but that worship can spring out from our own soul. And then this one, this one's the middle Passover. As I said, there's three of them. And the last Passover is the one where they actually crucify Jesus. So there's a whole lot going on in this text. But the the connections are are so numerous in this text that it would be impossible to cover them all. That's why I'm going to talk some more about some of this next week. But it all starts with the sacrifice and the Passover lamb, whose blood is spilled and marked on the doorway, right? If you know about Passover, they took lamb's blood, they put it over the doorway so that their children would be spared. That it would pass over the people of God. That's where the Passover comes from. That the spirit of death wouldn't come and and, and, and take their children. And then remember way back in chapter 1 of this, John. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now remember, we're in the middle of a story here. When Jesus is heralded as the the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, what does that do to the people of God? What does it do to the people of His time? How does that resonate with them? And what it does is, it's getting at their very identity. It's getting at the thing that, that, that defines them the most. Jesus is saying, who is the Lamb that makes judgment and passes judgment over you? As we spoke about last week, he says, it's me, right? Because life and judgment, things that are only specifically attributed to God, those are mine. Because the Father has given them to me. I am God. And and this is a, 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 a narrative arc that Jesus is is teasing out here. The the Old Testament manna is superseded by the real bread of life. 
The Exodus story sets forth that eternal life is given to the people of God and that they're delivered from sin and delivered from destruction. And Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of that. I am the one who does that. The the lamb and, and the bitter herbs and the unleavened bread, they don't do that. The things used at the Passover, those things, he says, are pointing to me. I do that. I am the bread of life. And then after the uh, resurrection and ascension of Jesus, the Passover feast is taken over by the Eucharist, the communion as we will celebrate today, the Lord's table. You and I don't, don't do Passover meals now, right? We take communion. But we're still celebrating what they were celebrating with the Passover. We just know in full what they only knew in part. If you're here around the Easter time, the last few years, we've had a a Seder meal. And we featured that during the Easter season. And and that helps us kind of put this a little bit into perspective. And we've tried to make that connection to what this Old Testament Passover meal, this Seder, connects that Old Testament system with what the New Testament experience is in living in Christ. And if we're thinking about the Bible, the, the movements from Moses all the way to Jesus, from Passover to Communion... They don't make any sense if, if we're seeing in John, if it's not about Jesus who's, who's looking back, saying he supersedes that lamb. And then if we're not looking forward to his death on the cross as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And as we see this, as we look at this, we see a, a progressive sanctification. This is, this is a, a come to me, Jesus is saying. My yoke is easy. He's, he's still speaking to this outer fringe of people. Come to me. My, my burden is light. And, and I love that he's putting out this, this invitation that's actually going out to this outer fringe, this outer ring of people. The, the men and women in this crowd haven't come to Jesus because he is the Messiah. They haven't come to Jesus because they want to submit to him. They've come out in kind of a fringe follower sort of way. I think there might be something there. Let's let's go check out this Jesus guy, right? And what Jesus does is he goes after this identity that they have that they certainly aren't walking in fulfillment of as Old Testament Jewish believers. Now understand this, that these people, the people of the time of Jesus, the Jews, They were people who were living under Roman oppression. And not only are they under Roman oppression, but they're under the the oppression of the religious leaders of their day as well, both of whom had been abusing their authority over them, using that authority that in ways was crushing and destroying the people of God. And Jesus shows up here and goes, okay, there's a different kind of authority here. The promises of the Passover find their fulfillment in me. Your identity is not in this heritage, or in this background that you have, your identity is found in me, in Jesus. I am the bread of life. Life is in me. I don't provide bread. I am the bread. Now think about this. What, what, kind, of, what kind of king dies for his peasants? Normally in, in human history, it's the peasants who die for the king, right? Right? It's Christianity alone that says, no, no, no. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, actually goes out and dies so that you don't have to. Now that's not all that's going on here. Another very encouraging part comes here. Look at this in in verse 16. It says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, And Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. And when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea, coming near the boat. And they were frightened. In other texts, it says that they thought he was a ghost. You see, the disciples in the boat think they're about to die. They're absolutely terrified. And here comes Jesus jogging across the water up to the boat, right? And he says to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat. 
And immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. Now this is important. For a first century Palestinian Jew, the sea was not a place of comfort. It wasn't a place to be desired to go to. For most people, they were in fact terrified of the sea. They didn't see the places uh, like, like we think of, you know, like I'm going to sunny San Diego and sitting on the beach all day, right? That's not how they viewed the sea. They weren't thinking of taking a vacation out by the Pacific Ocean to watch the sunset. Going, ooh, isn't this amazing? The sea to them was death. You can't drink it and it kills lots of people. And the disciples, they're out on the sea. And the wind and the rain and the waves have kicked up. And they're convinced they're going to die. And then they see what they think is a ghost, right? It's the Grim Reaper coming for us. They're freaked out. So they believe that the sea equals death. And the sea is going to swallow up and kill you. And then here comes a ghost. Of course they would be terrified. And if I can make it really simple, what's happening here is that, that Jesus is meeting the anxieties of his inner circle in this passage. If he's extending an invitation of life out to the outer circle before this, he's meeting the anxieties of his inner circle here, which I find very comforting. And there are two points here that I want to make sure you don't miss. And I think they're both quite profound. You'll see these in your notes. The first one is this. Even those closest to Jesus will get disorientated and anxious at times. Understand where we are at in the story. These brothers in the boat, they have just seen some things that are probably a little bit beyond what you or I will ever experience or see, right? How many of you have ever seen a box lunch feed 12,000 people? Seriously, right? These guys have seen some things. He's healed people from 20 miles away. Your son is healed. He walked up some giant jugs, water into wine, right? He's done some amazing things, and they've got to see that. And we're prone to say, you know, if I would have seen that, yeah, I, I would have believed, right? But that's not actually true. In fact, the Bible tells us that's not true. What the Bible tells us is, if you see a miracle, you'll demand another one. And if you see another one, you'll demand yet another one. And if you see another one, yet another one will be demanded, right? And what we have happening here is the disciples are, are, are terrified and they're anxious. And I actually think that's good news. Because I have found myself many times anxious and discombobulated and afraid, right? And Jesus doesn't get angry at them for that. He doesn't rage against them for it. He's not angry about it. He just simply reminds them of who he is. That's all he does. He says, guys, it's me. Now, I want to highlight this because I see a lot of fear and anxiety in our culture, right? There's a lot of things trying to speak into our lives to create fear and anxiousness and worry. Things that are trying to, to whip us into a frenzy around fear and anxiety in our culture. I don't recommend you watch TV news. I'm serious. Especially not the 24-hour news channels. All it is, fear and anxiety. I don't care what political party you, you fall into. I don't care which channel you watch. They're all doing it. Peddling fear. Fear, fear, fear. Worry, worry, worry. Conflict, conflict, conflict. Creating doubts. Creating animosity. Making a mess of our lives that we really don't need, frankly. And so they whip us into this frenzy. And it leads us into disunity and, and brokenness. And all that does is serve to please the enemy. And it breaks the heart of God. And that confusion can lead to doubts. Doubts of our faith and doubts of other people in faith. So if, if you have doubts of faith, if you have doubts that you are wrestling with, if you're in a, a season of anxiety, I just want to press you a little bit. Know that God knows. You see, when we have doubts, 
God is not surprised by our humanity. You know why you experience that? The reason you experience doubt? Look at me. The reason we experience doubt is because that's what humans do. It's okay to have doubts, to be anxious and have worry. Just don't rest in that. And Jesus meets them in their anxiety. He eases their anxiety simply by reintroducing himself. Oh my gosh, we're going to die! There's a ghost, he's coming to get us! Actually guys, it's me, Jesus. Whew, okay. All better now, right? I mean, that's a story in summary. And the Bible tells us in the other Gospels that the winds and the waves and the, the rain, they obey that it is I. And confidence was restored among these men. And they wanted to take him in the boat, right, it says. And here's the other miracle. They sought to take him in. Now their eyes are on Jesus. They're no longer on the storm, right? And then instantly, they make it to their destination. This is another sign. It's a, another miracle in this passage that as they sought to take Jesus into their boat, as their eyes were on Jesus, let's go get Jesus in the boat, guys. Oh my goodness, we're here, right? And, and that leads me to my second point. We'll wrap up with this. First one is that even those closest to Jesus will get disorientated and anxious at times. We also now see that Jesus is with us in our storms and he will get us safely home. Does that mean smooth sailing and easy life for all of the followers of Jesus? No. We're never promised that. Jesus never once does he ever promise us a life of ease. In fact, that's probably going to be the opposite. But he does promise us his presence. Jesus is going to be there with us no matter how life is going. And I don't know where you are today. I don't know how you've come in. I don't, maybe, maybe you're on that outer fringe or maybe you feel like you're in Jesus' inner circle. But, but wherever you find yourself today, I want to plead with you that there's more for you in Jesus. If you just see Jesus' golf as something you do on the weekend, Jesus is greater than just that golf-like relationship. And he sees you and he's invited you fully into his family. Maybe that's why you were here today to hear that message. Or maybe if you are a deeper follower of Jesus Christ, maybe this is a season for you. Anxiety, that, 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 that dark night of the soul, that, that, that space in which we watch King David walk through where, where he struggles and he says, How long, O oh Lord, will you forsake me? Will you forsake me forever? And even, even though David is called a man after God's own heart, he at times feels distanced from God. And then maybe you're in that season yourself right now as a follower of Christ. And then if so, hear Jesus through this text saying to you, I see you. I am here. I am with you. I haven't forgotten about you. I haven't abandoned you. I have not forsaken you. I am always with you. That's Jesus. That's the Jesus of this story, and that's the Jesus of now, and that's the Jesus of forever. He is with you. Lean into that this week. Know that wherever you go and whatever you might encounter, for the good or for the bad, that Christ goes with you. Amen? Let's pray.